Happy Mashoka Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek the Mashoka Tensei Jawas Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 17, chapter 9, and things just blew up. <laughs> things happened. <laughs> I have read 9, 10, 11, started getting into 12. My expectations was that 9, 10, 11 was all going to go together, but then 11 was not as big as I thought it would be. It's It's important, but not as, like crucial to the other two chapters i think for sure nine and ten go together so we're definitely going to cover that we'll see what we do with time as per usual i don't want to push things but at the same time i do hate cliffhangers but <laughs> as per usual thank you guys so much for dropping by for the premiere hey chat hope you guys are doing well be nice don't spoil things and hit the like button down there <laughs> greatly appreciate you guys support everybody for their kind words everything it, it means so much to me and as per usual greatly appreciate everybody at sports channel monetarily through patreon tips links super thanks memberships all that stuff. It means so much to me. Since I am recording this before the next Mishoka Monday, technically I don't have any shout outs. So anybody that drops some crazy <laughs> donations and supers and memberships, thank you so much. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. No, nope. all the right there, Andrew from the past. Andrew from the future has got you covered. <laughs> Gearless, Kusha, Noah, Joshua, Nico, and all the new members. Thank you guys so much for your support. It means so much to me. Right back to you, Andrew from the past. But yeah, with all that said, let's jump right into Chapter 9, Ariel's Battlefield. At one of the Silver Palace's great reception halls, there was a long single table in the room. It was decorated and set with assigned seats all around it. Rudius was there as a member of the staff. Edis stood near the entrance to the waiting room. The waiting room wasn't too cramped. Many guests inside looked eager, hopeful, and anxious. However, many of them arrived quite early. Most conversation was about what Princess Ariel might say, and how Grabble's faction would react. The tone of chatter was mostly light, probably because none of the big names had arrived. Most of the earlier guests were lesser nobles who wouldn't be too seriously affected by who took the throne. Palmon Nodos Greyrat was the first major player, arriving a little late with his eldest son. Palmon paused at the entrance and fixed a glare on Rudius. Huff, do you think that you can warm your way back into the Nodos Greyrat house after all these years? The idea never crossed my mind, honestly. Remember this, boy. By all rights, you shouldn't even be permitted to call yourself a Greyrat. Um, right, okay. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> crap's given, zero. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let me show you how much I care. Oh, wait. I can't find it. After delivering this confusing attempt at an insult, Pylemon studied the faces of the room, before disappearing into a private room reserved for high nobility. As Edis hissed about Pylemon's attitude, Roos recalled back when he was with the Boreas Grey Rats, how they all assumed that he was uncomfortable with his family's awkward social position. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but Roos wondered what would happen if Paul asked the Notos family to take him in instead, tutoring one of their children. Dealing with Pylemon would have been miserable. <laughs> Yeah, he had like a little bit of conflict there, but not as bad. I, I mean, it's literally replacing this violent Edis <laughs> with violent Paimon. <laughs> it would be, it'd be like probably more verbal abuse than physical abuse. That was all in the past now. And despite being his uncle, he was their enemy that Ghislaine would kill before too long. It was best that he couldn't stand the guy. Yeah, I just want to keep hating him. That way I don't feel bad for him dying. <laughs> That's a nice thought. Soon important guests began to show up at a steady pace. There was the parents of Ariel's attendants and members of Triss's family. Additionally, the heads of the four great houses arrived. Yoros clan came first, then Sephiros, and finally, Boreas. The new head of the Boreas family was James. Much like Pylemon, he strode in with his eldest son. The man looked more like Saros than Philip had. He had a muscular build and a face noticeably haggard. <laughs> Hasn't been having a good time. <laughs> Ariel told Rudius that James resigned his post as high minister to assume the new role as liege lord of Fatoa. With everything being gone after the displacement incident, he was struggling to get his footing. It was impressive that the house of Boreas hadn't just folded under the pressure. Maybe they were leveraging the value of the empty land somehow, or maybe James was trying to keep afloat through heroic personal effort. The wear on his face was proof that he wasn't just sitting around all day. He probably had to fight hard for his own survival after the disaster. Not that many of the victims of the disaster would have sympathy for his position. After James glanced at Edis briefly, he headed to the private waiting room as well. Finally, after everyone else arrived, High Minister Darius walked in with a single bodyguard. <laughs> there he is! Laying eyes on Rudius, he gave a fearful grimace, and the bodyguard approached Rudius. It was interesting to get a look at the man in broad daylight for once. He was dressed casually, hair making him look like a poisonous mushroom, and four swords at his waist. It's a great pleasure to meet you, sir. I am the North Emperor Arbor Corrit, although I'm commonly referred to as the Peacock Blade. Rudius looking down, he was standing comfortably on both legs. <laughs> he didn't even have a limp. Given how wealthy Osra was, it was no surprise that he had healers to patch him up. The pleasure's all mine. I've heard quite a lot about you. My name's Rudius Greyrat. Oh, Quackmire Rutius. Or perhaps you'd prefer Rudius the Dragon's Dog. <laughs> the Dragon's Dog. Mmm. Mmm. 
just wondered if he meant Orsted was the new Killmaster. How nostalgic. Yeah, that was a little bit of a tip of a hand right there. Back in his adventuring days, he was the one holding the leash. But now, the tables had turned. Though Orsted probably wouldn't bother trying to improve the reputation of his people. <laughs> I thought he was the kennel master because he was controlling Edis, the mad dog. I guess it's implying here that that's more in the case of him controlling Rejurd. So yeah, I guess that Orsted to Rudius to Rudius to Rejurd thing is <laughs> to help Rudius with his people. I don't know. My apologies, sir. I understand your party came under several attacks in the recent days. I'm afraid so. They say you warded off cowardly ambushes of your opponents with great skill, however. Rudy's thought he was calling himself a coward. <laughs> Aubrey was smiling lightly, like this was just a joke between the two of them. But his eyes didn't look amused at all. Next time, perhaps you'll have a fairer fight. For a moment, his face became uncharacteristically serious. Before he turned and walked away. Was this a declaration? <laughs> Was this a declaration of war? In their last two encounters, he targeted Rudius. Maybe he was, in fact, the third disciple. I don't know the whole saying the dragon's dog. I think that's a big hint, Rudius. But again, he could have heard that secondhand from somebody else. But no, I do like this because it almost feels like Auber is seemingly not liking that he's been doing the ambushes. I mean, it is his style, but I, I think there is a side of him that is... I mean, it was going to my question mark that I had in the last Michelle Monday. I was talking about how... I was curious as if Auber was going to come back at all. He blew off his leg. He went and fleed. And the question mark was, you know, is he going to get his leg back? Would he even want to come back and fight later? Does Ruiz have to worry about him? And it was always coming down to, is it money? Is it fame? Is it challenge? And I think right here, it is. I mean, later on, we do find out exactly what it is. But I think right here in conversation, it is an aspect of almost pride. Like, I'm going to get you next time. Like, this time I'm going to face you head on. And it's going to be different. Though it is kind of question mark is how much does he know what is actually going to unfold? Like, was he prepared for what actually happened? It didn't seem like he was prepared because he was pretty hesitant. But that could be what he was told to do. That aside, everyone but the first Prince Grabble had arrived. He'd be showing up once the party began. Thus, the party began in earnest. Nobles entered the hall in specific orders and took their seats at a massive table. Ruiz watched alongside the other bodyguards. Ariel had arranged it so there would be almost no palace guards on duty. So most of the nobles brought their own. Edis and Ghislaine stood beside Rudius, keeping an eye on their surroundings. Sylphie wasn't here at all. She was waiting elsewhere and playing an important role for the ceremonies to come. After everyone settled in, Ariel stepped forward at the head of the table. Thank you all for taking so much time out of your busy schedules to attend the party. She welcomed them before mentioning her father's illness and remarked on the state of Asra. She spoke about how she felt watching the events afar during her studies abroad. But then her attack began. Now then... There is a specific reason why I've gathered you all to here today, as it happens. I have two people I'd like to introduce you to. <laughs> we know exactly who the two people are. The first is Philip, the blacksmith. He's such a nice guy. <laughs> he made this ring for me. Anyway, sorry. Triss entered the room in a beautiful dress and walked to Ariel's side. I knew it. I called it. It would be her first. And then, yeah. Darius's eyes went wide at the sight of her. A few other nobles at the table rose to their feet, color draining from their faces. Those were probably the representatives of the Purple Horse family. This is Tristina, the second daughter of the house Purple Horse. By sheer coincidence, I met her on my travels. In the most unlikely of places, Triss executed a flawless curtsy, far smoother than something that Edis could manage. Thank you for your introductions, your highness. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tristina Purple Horse. I'm trying to fight off the southern accent because she's being clear and... And, and proper with her voice. <laughs> I'm fighting it. A stir of voices filled the hall. People shocked that she was alive and found. However, eventually comments centered on the question of why she was here. Good question. <laughs> when I found her and took her into my protection, Tristina was in a terribly weakened state, but she told me that she had several things to say to you all. And so I brought her with me to this gathering. Tris approached Darius on cue, looking at him with disdain. She began to tell her story. Instead of rough tones of a bandit, her words were clean and elegant, like a proper noblewoman. She spoke of the betrayal of her family, purchased by Darius, being his pet. How she nearly lost her life following the displacement incident. How she survived, becoming a bandit leader's plaything. Then, finally, how Ariel rescued her. She, of course, left out the part where she became a bandit, <laughs> and it was slightly dramatized. But she spoke it in a calm, steady voice. It was a story carefully tweaked to tug at the heartstrings and many nobles broke into tears. Though Rudius assumed Ariel asked them to do that beforehand. Yeah, she's like, she's gonna tell her story, make sure to cry. <laughs> that way you can kind of just, just push that emotion. 
because yeah, sadly, I could see a lot of these noble women and noblemen just not really caring. Like, who the hell cares? <laughs> I don't know who this girl is. Still, many, especially those allied with Darius, had a clear expression of shock and dismay. Members of the Purple Horse family in particular were white-faced with fear and were sweating profusely. Darius, however, maintained his expression, giving no sign of losing his composure. He was the man who slipped his way out of so many tougher spots before this. Finishing her story, Triss returned to Ariel's side. Now then, this is all quite surprising, Minister Darius. I certainly didn't expect to have such shocking events revealed in front of everyone like this. It's truly hard to believe. Could you really have abused your powers so blatantly, kidnapped a girl of noble birth, and treated her as your personal slave? Her tone was calm at first, but began to heat up rapidly as she continued, spitting words at Darius with righteous fury in her voice. Is this truly how the High Minister of Asura comports himself? Is this truly the behavior of a man who administers our entire kingdom? What an utter disgrace. Do you have anything to say for yourself, sir? <laughs> She's laying on thick. Darius gave a disdainful snort as he slowly rose to his feet. Oh, I need a voice for Darius. <laughs> a voice for Darius, ugh. Princess Ariel, you take your little games a bit too far today. His narrow eyes shone with malice, then turned to Triss. I hardly expected you to grab some woman off the streets and insist on calling her the daughter of the house purple horse. Oh, I know my enemies delight in spreading vicious rumors of this sort behind my back, but truly, this is the first time anyone has thrown such lies directly in my face. He turned to look around the room, silently encouraging others to agree with him. You claim her story is untrue then? Naturally. Now I have a question of my own for you, Princess Ariel. Do you have any proof whatsoever that this Miss Tristina is indeed the second daughter of the House Purple Horse? Tristina? Tristina brought out a ring with a purple jewel at its center, the image of a horse carved on it. Ah, an amethyst with the image of a horse. To be sure, that is what the members of the Purple Horse House have to prove their identity. He admitted this easily enough, but he hadn't lost his composure. If anything, his smile grew sharper and more hateful. I see, I see. Since this lovely girl carries that ring, it would seem she truly is Purple Horse. Or, so one might initially believe. As it so happens, I have the news of my own to share concerning Tristina Purple Horse. I'm afraid she was identified quite recently. Identified? I'm sure you all remember. Ladies and gentlemen, a certain operation we conducted in the capital about a month ago. Its purpose was to round up members of a certain criminal organization that had taken root in the royal capital. In the course of that exercise, I'm afraid the body of Miss Tristina was discovered. A month ago, Rudy thought? So he was preparing this in advance. Of course, her signet ring had already been sold off in the black market, so it was difficult for us to conclusively establish her identity. However, Miss Tristina's body had distinctive features that only the, her family knew about. A crescent moon shaped birthmark on her breast. Rudy thought that had to be a lie. Triss didn't have any birthmark of that kind, or at least any that Rudy had seen. <laughs> she wore very revealing clothing. He's like, okay, think about it over here. No, I don't remember anything. <laughs> I believe the head of the house Purple Horse will be able to confirm all of this for us. Is that right, Lord Freitas, Purple Horse? They had no good way to prove Darius was lying. If he had House Purple Horse backing them, his falsehood would become truth. And if he had Triss expose her skin, he could prove her an imposter by that truth. That is actually very clever. The idea here is that Triss is literally standing here. Darius knows that. Darius knows full dang well that that's probably Triss or Tristina. But the cool thing he's doing here is he's literally going, I'm going to create this fake Triss over here and say that one was the real one. Say that she's dead. And the obvious thing here is that her body's gone and he can claim, yeah, she had this massive birthmark on her stomach, but nobody knows if it's true except for the, the family of her. And now what he's doing is going, okay, now tell them that my lie is true and there's no way they can disprove it. They, they can't literally say, well, okay, now show your belly. The belly, the, the, it never existed. He just created it for this dead child that the family confirmed is real. It is, it is clever. It is clever. Reese was wondering what Ariel was planning here. Her poker face smile on. It was hard to tell. He only hoped that she wasn't screaming inside right now. <laughs> I can see that. She got that, that calm poker face and she's standing there like, hmm, okay, well, let's see what they say. And then inside she's going, damn it, <laughs> no. <laughs> I always like that whenever they do that with shows and stuff like that, where the character looks all like normal, and then it goes inside their head and it's screaming. Uh, anyways, a man who seemed like the head of the family rose to his feet. He resembled Triss, although his ashen face and quivering lips suggest he wasn't much like his brazen bandit of a daughter. Well, that's what she became. Come on. <laughs> that's what she became. 
Go on, Lord Freitas. You identified the body yourself, didn't you? You know as well as I do that Tristina is deceased, not missing. The woman standing before you is an imposter who has assumed Tristina's name. Perhaps you could testify to this effect, sir, if only to bring an end to this distasteful farce. However, unless you do so, I'm afraid we'll have to ask the lady to expose herself in public, which would be most regrettable. Darius looked sure of himself, and Ariel's slight smile hadn't left her face either. Freitas, on the other hand, was trembling like a newborn calf. The tension in the air was thick. He's literally like, okay, literally like two sides of it. It's literally, it's literally saying choose Ariel or Gravel. Which one do you choose? <laughs> Who is going to be the successor in the end? My daughter was stolen from us by Minister Darius. Lord Freitas, what are you saying? That woman standing there is my daughter, Tristina Purplehorse. There's no doubt in my mind. Princess Ariel, I beg you, give this man a rightful punishment for abducting and abusing my child. Darius leaned forward and knocked his chair over in the process. Don't be absurd, Freitas. You placed your seal on that identification document personally. Ariel smiled very slightly. No such document exists, Lord Darius. What? Ariel had won over House Purple Horse beforehand. She anticipated this trick by Darius and undermined it in advance. Ruiz had to learn from this woman. <laughs> You want to become, like, super, super conniving, sure. Ariel continued, while a smile was still on her face. Ruius began to sense malice. Now then, High Minister, given the testimony of the head of the House Purple Horse, it seems that you truly did kidnap, imprison, and rape an innocent girl of noble birth. Regardless of your importance in this kingdom, such crimes cannot be excused. I expect that you will be punished in accordance with our laws. Darius's face contorted horribly in fear and rage. Eyes darting around the room. He no longer had a single ally at the table. Outplayed entirely. His fall was guaranteed. If his old friend backed him, he'd wiggle free. Now none wanted to risk being a co-conspirator. There was an explanation for this. They believed the first Prince Gravel would take the throne. Even without Darius. With him gone, they would move up one rank in the hierarchy of their faction. All his former ally, men and women, who ate from his hands for many years, now abandoned him. Darius was done. Ariel had destroyed him. It's a very, very good point. <laughs> you think you're allies. You think you're friends. But on something like this, the moment you slip, that's just one more step up for me. I will destroy this guy if I can get one more step ahead. There's no reason to stick my head out otherwise. He shook a step back, and the other nobles would drag him down on their own. Even if he got off lightly in court, no respecting member of the Osprey nobility would miss a chance to crush one of their own. Only one person at this party would be inconvenienced by Darius's fall, one who risked having his role in the man's many schemes exposed. This party seems more boisterous than I'd expected. First Prince Gravel had appeared, almost like he was waiting for this very moment. Entering the room from behind the seat of honor, eyes fixed sharply on Ariel, but his face was calm and neutral. Round two was about to begin. Old Gravel finally shows up. He's like, like <laughs> I have this mental image of him like sitting at the door. Just waiting, waiting. Aw, oh, dang it. Okay, not good, not good, not good. Okay, uh, wait, wait, wait. Open the door. <laughs> what is all this crap going on in here? Oh, I just arrived. What is going on? <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. Who's this girl over here? Gravel Zaffin Asra strode in towards his sister without sparing anyone else a glance. What is the meaning of this disgraceful commotion, Ariel? Have you forgotten that our father is seriously ill? What commotion? I'm simply defending the honor of our nobility as a whole. I'm saying that there's a time and a place for these things. With our father incapacitated, the kingdom of Asra can hardly afford to lose the many talents of our high minister. Perhaps, perhaps not. Either way, his crimes are real. Even if these accusations are true, Darius is a high noble, and the members of the House Purple Horse are of the middle rank. It should be obvious which one of them are more valuable to our kingdom. In Maurice's previous life, there was a saying that everyone was equal. But this was the kingdom of Asra. People were not born equal here. No one pretended they were. That's a yeah, true. <laughs> Sadly true. And that's literally what he's saying here. Darius steps in this room, and obviously he has something to gain slash lose right here. But he's literally walking in the room saying, but he's the high minister. He's the high minister. Yes, he did something wrong. To, or he's saying if he did something wrong to House Purple Horse, they're middles. They're, they're down here. They're, their value to this kingdom is nothing. And since this thing is going on with dad, he's important. We can't lose him. So just overlook it. Just, this isn't important. 
Who cares what this what happened to this girl? We need his power. We need all of his talents. Forget the law. Forget crimes. Because I need him. <laughs> and he's important to me. <laughs> I don't dispute that, Gravel. But while I hesitate to repeat myself, his crimes are real. As a kingdom of laws, we can't simply ignore them. And so he must be punished? I see. You're not entirely wrong, Ariel. But you know as well as I do that there's many others in this room who ought to have their deeds exposed and punished. Do you intend to toss every one of them into jails? Of course, if it becomes necessary. <laughs> Bold statement there. Reading between the lines, Ariel was promising that she wouldn't punish anyone who was necessary to her. Nobody batted an eye at that, of course. It was amazing just how stinking rotten this kingdom really was. This is kind of a weird, the way this this is worded, I, I assume that it was supposed to, okay, in my mind, as I was reading this, my brain stopped here because it didn't make sense to me. It sounded like she he was literally forcing her to tell everybody in that room if they support her, she's going to throw them all in the jail. But it's saying that, promising that she wouldn't punish anyone that was necessary to her. I guess, yes, it makes sense the idea that if she's punishing Darius, that she's punishing him just simply because he is against her. But by saying, yes, if it comes necessary for anybody in the room, she will. So she technically is saying that she would punish them. It's a little weird. Either way, it makes sense. <laughs> so you're convinced that punishing Darius is necessary then. And I believe the opposite. With a small snort of laughter, Gravel smiled condescendingly at his sister. It seems that we're at something of an impasse then. I suppose we are. Regrettably, the two of us are unable to reach a decision on this matter. The High Minister would usually mediate such disputes, but as this concerns him personally, in accordance with the customs, we ought to put this matter to a vote. Conveniently, it seems that we have nearly all of Osra's foremost men and women in this very room. Would you all be so kind as to decide which of us is in the right? It sounded dramatic, but he was really asking which of them would be winning this fight. That was an unspoken threat. Anyone against him would be his enemy, purged when he had his power. The nobles weren't startled by this, probably because they knew what would happen in the future. Maybe something similar happened before, when he was competing with the second prince. In any case, they'd be deciding here and now whose side they were on, publicly saying who they were aligned with. Yes, <laughs> it is literally going, again, it was kind of like the whole situation with Darius earlier when he said that. It's literally saying, vote now, who's going to be king or queen. Darius was broken, which was a serious loss for Gravel's faction, but they still had influential nobles at their side. Notos and Boreas of the great four houses, along with other high nobles. His forces were stronger and his victory was guaranteed. That sounds very reasonable, Gravel. But before it comes to that, there is one other person I wanted to introduce to everyone. What? Snapping her fingers, Elmoy sent a signal from outside with a ring. With an ear-splitting roar, a huge column of fire spiraled into the air just beyond the windows. This was an intermediate spell, flame, pillar, size magnified through the use of silent spellcasting. The flame rose into the sky, scorching the palace walls. This was all Sylphie's handiwork. What is the meaning of this? What? Huh? It can't be! Nobles rose their feet, watching the flames go by. The spell itself wasn't the shock for them. It was what was beyond it. Something massive moved the night sky, illuminated by soaring flames. It was something you didn't see every day, and even in a city like ours. Is that the floating fortress? When did it arrive in Osra? The floating fortress chaos breaker had made its arrival. <laughs> so there's the answer to that question. How is it going to happen? <laughs> he literally going to jump down there. <laughs> Pettigoose's majestic castle approached at a speed that was downright frightening, flying so low it, it seemed like it was going to crash into them. As the trembled aristocrats watched through the window, the fortress stopped right above them, floating in the sky above the Silver Palace. The room had gone absolutely silent, but Rudius wondered how Pettigus would get down. <laughs> Everybody's like shocked and Rudius is like, how's he going to get down from there? The nobles began to whisper amongst themselves. The tension and fear on their faces gave way to excitement as they stared at the windows. After a little while, footsteps could be heard approaching. Based on the sound, it seemed like as only one person was outside, but some of the bodyguards had clearly sensed he wasn't actually alone. There was 12 others silently accompanying him. Those who had noticed were trembling where they stood. They had realized the stories were true. Elmoy announced the guest arrival as footsteps stopped. Everyone was holding their breaths while the door swung open. A silver-haired, golden-eyed man in a white cloak walked in the room. He wasn't a perfect match for his portrait, but his overpowering presence 
and 12 servants left no room for doubt. That is a true thing to kind of point out is that yes, technically in these hallways, there is that portrait. And yes, he looked younger and more dashing and whatever. But the key thing here is that he has seemingly aged. He doesn't look like his portrait. So there has to be some sort of signification to these people that have never seen him before. They've never, there's probably everybody in this room besides of course, Rudius and Ariel and all them. Everybody in this room, none of them has ever put their eyes on this man. So how do you know? The fortress is literally the biggest signifier there, but also technically him walking in with the famous 12 servants. Some shuddered or flinched in fear. Others stared with respect and admiration in their eyes. Indifferent to all this, he strode across the room, parting the crowd of nobles. Finally, he reached Ariel and Gravel. His 12 spirits split into groups of six and positioned themselves to either side of the hall. One group stood by Rudius, Ariel's bodyguard, the other besides Auber, who served Darius. Savarl, who looked a little dressed up for the occasion, took a spot directly at the side of Rudius. It was hard to say for sure because of his... It was hard to say for sure because of his mask. But Rudius had a sense he was in an unusually good mood. <laughs> Yep. Oh, goodness. Oh, seven C's. But I can sense that he was in an unusually good mood. So I, I, I don't know. I guess Savarl's a dude now. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to judge. I mean, if... Who knows? Maybe between the last time that we've seen Savarl, uh, Pettigus decided... <laughs> She's too thirsty for me. I gotta turn her into a boy, even though that might not change the fact that he's thirsty for me. I don't know. I don't know why they decided to randomly gender Savarl as a dude when, and I, it was so funny because I actually went back and checked. I'm like, well, maybe I assume Savarl was a was a girl. I mean, Luke obviously was was had the hots for her and everything, and he seems to like charming women. Maybe it was maybe it was a mistake, but no. Everywhere before this, they gendered Savarl as a girls and but now it's a dude who whatever anyways damn it seven seas moment there's a damn it seven seas moment my thanks for your kind invitation ariel amoy osara but it seems i'm a bit late to the party perhaps not at all the guest of honor should always be the last to enter pedagos had a smile on his face <laughs> and ariel was beaming with delight <laughs> she's like yes yes gravel on the other hand seemed to have no idea what to do with himself <laughs> He was just staring at Pettigoose with wide eyes. Everyone, allow me to introduce you to the Armored Dragon King, one of the legendary three God Slayers. Pettigoose didn't bow, but simply ran his eyes over the crowd in a manner of a lord. As his eyes met the nobles, they dropped their knees and bowed their heads in tribute. Greetings, I am Pettigoose Dola. It was most comical how good he was at the role of a king. He had no real authority here. He had real prestige. In terms of clout, he might command even more than the actual king. Now then, everyone, raise your heads. I join you tonight as a guest. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no need to show such difference to a man you'll soon break bread with. At those words, the nobles rose uncertainly to their feet and took their places again. <laughs> Pettigus then looked around the table with a curious grunt. There was only three seats opened. <laughs> the place of honor and two others at the side. <laughs> Ariel... <laughs> Gravel and Pettigus still stood. Well, this is something of a problem. It seems that we only have three seats available. Tell me, Ariel Anamoyasra, Gravel Zafen Nasra, which of them should I occupy? <laughs> we all know the head of the table has to be Gravel. He is the honored guest. That was who, and this is literally goes back to what she did, What she, the, everything she set up here. She literally set up Come to this party. We are honoring Gravel. Thus, Gravel has that seat. But Ariel knows full well she's going to bring Pettigus in here. And Pettigus is going to ask, where do I seat? And that forces Gravel to have to say, take my seat. Because you're more important to me. In this room of people, you're more important to these people. They see more respect in you. And thus, you have to take that seat. So he has to give it up. And it's an insult to himself. It's, it's so clever. Gravel inhaled sharply. And the others at the table swallowed it up. <laughs> swallowed audibly. 
this is all a farce. And if Rudius knew that, everyone else did as well. They had all picked up on who Pettigus had spoken to. By all means, please take the seat of honor, Lord Pettigus. Gravel spoke with a tremble in his voice. He was as overwhelmed as anyone else. Pettigus had no authority to decide the next king or assign himself a seat at the table. There was no need for Gravel to yield so easily. Someone at the table could have pointed this out and normally would, but in this moment, most of the guests were incapable of considering the matter so calmly and coldly. <laughs> By this point, they understood why Ariel had destroyed Darius just before she staged this scene. Pettigus went on to speak in a tone almost casual, and no one dared to interrupt him. No, I think not. I've spent too many years away from this country to plant myself in the seat belonging to its next ruler. <laughs> he then pushed gently at Ariel's back. At the same time as he spoke the words, next ruler. Ariel, you take it instead. I'll content myself with a chair at your side. In that moment, every noble in the room knew Ariel would be king. <laughs> I freaking love that scene. I love that so freaking much. <laughs> again, again, it's literally saying, this is an important chair. Where do I sit? The important chair? No. I'm not that important. That's for the next ruler of this country. Pettigus literally just said, this is your queen. <laughs> like, he literally walked, he literally, like, you didn't even, he didn't even need the whole thing with Darius. That's what, that's the funny thing. You didn't even need the, th the thing with Darius. Now, maybe Darius would be able to speak up for Grabel and the two of them in the, the high minister is very important. Make no mistake. But it's still that aspect of like, you can almost feel like literally Pettigrew entering that room and saying, you're the queen. I picked her. It's insane. It's insane to think how much that means to everybody in that room. Nobody's going to argue with this guy. He's one of the legendary heroes. One of the people that literally saved this nation. Crazy. I love it. Such a good scene. <laughs> Ariel had triumphed. She used Rudius to ward off Aber her own talents to control Luke. <laughs> Triss to bring down Darius. Pettigus to defeat Gravel. Of course, she'd probably have other battles to fight in the coming years, but in this moment, she triumphed. Darius and Gravel had no cards that could trump Pettigus. But of course, those two weren't the only players in the game. Suddenly, Savarl cried out, Lord Pettigus! The ceiling of the hall caved in. A grand chandelier smashed into the ground crushing a noble underneath it. Flying fragments of stone and metal wounded several others. A woman fell to the center of the table, plunging down and ripping it straight through. She held her gorgeous golden yellow sword as if it was walking stick. There was a little old lady standing in the middle of the rubble. Good grief, guess this is what the prophecy was all about. She murmured to herself as she hopped down onto the stage. And with fierce glances around the room, she called to Darius. Well, I suppose I'm here to save you. It was the water god, Rada Leah. The man god had just played his final card. Oh, this next chapter is so freaking good. This next chapter is so freaking good. <laughs> chapter 10 is so amazing. Chapter 10. Rudius is battlefield. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this chapter 10. Orsted's battlefield. <laughs> but let's, so let's just go with that. Or chapter 10. Pettigoose's amusement. <laughs> this whole chapter in the next chapter is just freaking Pettigoose's amusement. It was a good thing I came here. This is amusing. The Water God style has five secret techniques of great power, all crafted by the first Water God ever to hold the title. It's said that anyone capable of using three out of five was worthy of the title Water God. In the long history of the style, there was numerous Water Gods who managed to learn four, but none except the first master all five. The Water God Raedalia was no exception to the rule. She had learned only three of five techniques. Raedalia was an old woman now, her peak physical years long since passed. Why then did she still possess the title Water God? Simply being immensely talented? That was part of it. Rada Leah had been a true prodigy in her youth, and her natural gifts were comparable to any water god who'd gone before her. But her talent alone weren't enough to offset her age. Were there no other skilled ones to claim the role? Far from it. By now, there were several other living swordsmaster who learned three techniques. Yet none of them tried to succeed Rada as the water god calling themselves unworthy of the title. They left it in her hands and content themselves with the rank of Water Emperor. This was because Rada had mastered the two most difficult techniques of the five. By combining those two, she created something of her own, a skill that might be called an illusion of sorts, or perhaps the sixth secret technique. 
It was known as the Blade of Deprivation, or the Deprivation Field. With a certain stance, she could cut down anyone within a certain range around her, no matter where they're positioned. The zone of effect was a perfect sphere around her. When anyone took a step within that zone, she could instantly counterattack them. Don't any of you move a muscle now, unless you want to end up like them. The first to react was Armonfi the Bright. In a blink of an eye, he moved directly behind her, only to be cut in two. His lifeless body had dissolved into particles of light and disappeared. Next was Trophimus, the wave. He was cut in half the moment he raised his hand towards Rada to fire something off. Next was Rudius, who channeled mana into the ring on his finger, only to have Rada cut off his left hand. Or at least she should have, if it weren't for the magically enhanced gauntlet he was wearing. Her blade struck at his fingers, partially destroying it and leaving Rudius in shock. That's interesting. What, she's basi what they basically laid out here is three methods. Well, technically two and a half methods. And the idea that physical, Armonfi the Bright, who literally can move at the speed of light, boom, right behind her, she cut him. That's some crazy fast movement. <laughs> to be able to turn to something that moved at a speed of light behind you, which is literally instantaneous, instantaneously react to an instantaneous movement and cut it in half. Then immediately, yes, a moving hand, the assumption there is a spell. And yes, the way this style is, is counterattacks. She's countering. She's not attacking. She's not going on the offense. She's literally going, don't move. And anybody that moves, bam, dead. It's literally a, it's a stance that can't do anything but defend and counter attacks. So as long as nobody attacks, it's, no, it's not a big deal. Now, granted, it does get into the idea that she does attack somebody, but still with these attacks, it's through counters. And then you have the spell casting. Somebody lifted the hand to fire off a spell. She counters it. Then with Rudius, he literally just channels mana into a ring and she knows and she counters. I think the Rudius part is a little bit more interesting out of all of it because it's not that he's going on the offense. He's merely channeling mana, which can be perceived as offense. Yeah, I knew the moment that the, the channel the ring. I'm like, oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I know where that's going to. He's calling up Nanahoshi. <laughs> He's, Rudius is like, damn it, gotta call Nanahoshi. <laughs> Tell Nanahoshi to take out of my family for me. The next was one of the high nobles who leapt onto his feet to flee, only to have the tendons in his legs severed and knocked unconscious. Now right there, it kind of makes me believe that's not just, well, that could be just a normal attack. Whereas her, the other the other ones is, it's literally a, uh, literally she's saying it's a sphere that she can basically fight. But it could be that she goes to attack if she wants to, which is not technically their style. Their style is to counter. But she can still swing a sword. It's not like she can't go on the offense. It's just their style is counter. None of the bodyguards, Pedagus or Ariel, could move. Rita had them pinned into places like insects on a board. Any movement would be fatal. Looks like everyone's frozen up. All right, Auber. Auber was standing stiffly in place like everyone else. Even a swordsman of his caliber couldn't break from the overwhelming power. W what can I do for you, ma'am? You can cut off a couple of heads. For starters, let's see. Go kill Ariel and Pedagus. And Quagmire, too. With that, Auber became the one capable of movement. Instead of stepping forward, he stared at Rita with an uncertain expression. Y you want me to do this? Use your head, boy. Who else is going to do it? But, but, he glanced to Edis, and Rita spat scornfully onto the floor. I guess having that girl on the other side is always going to be a problem, wasn't it? No wonder both of your ambushes were so half-assed. Even cowards like you want to play the swordsman for their students. Look, kid, what did you take that fat sack of money for anyways? You're just here to cash in on your fancy title, let three of your old buddies die, and then watch your client get his head cut off? Aren't you supposed to be a guy who fights dirty? I, I suppose you're right. That is actually a massive shock. The, I, I, <laughs> the first time I read this, I'm like, is that, is that saying what I think it's saying? It's literally implying that he is, he doesn't want to look bad in front of Eris. Like, Eris is affecting his choice here. Like, he should have been somewhat in the know for what's going on. It seems like he's completely caught off guard. So this, it seems like there's way much more going on here than he was actually planning on. Literally what Raida is telling him is to go around and execute people. And he's like, wait, I'm supposed to do that? It does, it, he was hired in here by Darius. He's supposed to be helping Darius survive. But in this moment, it's pushing it over this line that he wasn't expecting to happen. But it's interesting that he looks to Edis. And she's like, what are you doing? Who, who cares about her? Like, he's bothered by her being in the room. Like, he doesn't want to look bad. So it does kind of show that he did sort of, 
he wanted to look good in front of her because she's his student. But additionally, that somewhat of a connection happened with him and Edis. Like he gained somewhat of a connection with her, which is super surprising and sad that we never got that whole segment. We literally just got his introduction there and that was it. So very interesting. As Aubrey moved towards Ariel, Rhea's contemplated his options. The man god had outplayed them, dropping a single sword master in at the perfect time. Orse had told him how to deal with the water god in battle. His advice was to make sure this never happened. <laughs> the moment you spot her, you were supposed to get outside of her range of vision before she assumed her stance. It didn't matter which way you fled, you just had to move while you could. It was too late for that now. Good lord, what is going on here? A group of guards entered to the commotion. They wore silver armor that looked familiar. To drop your sword. Down any of you move. Rada's voice, fierce as thunder, stopped the knights in their tracks. But one amongst them ignored the warning, removed her helmet, and tossed to the ground. It was Isolde, Cluel, the Water King. I was... I was sort of expecting Isolde showed up. There was a side of me that wondered if Isolde was going to be involved in what Rada was doing. Obviously, that's not the case of what happens, but yeah, I, I kind of expected that she would show up and she'd be involved because she respected Rita so much. But it was going to be one of those cases where she didn't want to go that far. Just like with Aubrey. We're going that far. <laughs> Rita's old and, yes, can be pushed off that cliff. Again, this whole idea of cutting her loose. But I think it's more of an idea that she's just old and she doesn't care. Like, okay, let's do this. This is, I'm, I'm old, I'm, I'm close to my death, might as well do this one last thing. It was confusing to see her here, as Ariel seen to the knights not being on duty today. It could be Darius' is doing, stationing them in case something like this happened. Master Rada, what, what on earth? Oh, hey there, Isolda. Why are you using this technique in the middle of this gathering? Calm down, girl. I'll explain. What you're seeing here is a horrific crime, perpetrated by Rada, Leah, and Aubrey Cupboard. Wh what You see, the two of them were working on behalf of, let's say, the King Dragon Realm. Dazzled by promises of great wealth, they agreed to assassinate the major nobles in this area. But, after murdering Ariel and a few others, Rada was cut down by a novice knight who happened to be posted nearby. Isolde Klul becomes a hero, and Water God's style lives on. With a small laugh, Rada paused to glance towards the First Prince. Pretty solid story, if I do say so myself. Do me a favor and go with something like that, Gravel. What are you saying, Master? Have you lost your mind? Isolde started to step forward, but stopped mid-stride. She probably sensed that Rada was now prepared to cut her down like all the others. Do it, Aubrey. And make it snappy. What? You think you're gonna hurt the North God Styles' reputation or something? Too damn bad. I'm cleaning up your mess here, boy. Hurry up and grow a pair. Aubrey lifted his sword at Ariel, then paused, shaking his head indecisively, looking obviously conflicted. What are you doing standing there, Aubrey? Kill Ariel now, and that lying harlot too. Was Darius talking about Triss? That made sense that he wanted her dead too. If any evidence remained of his crimes, the other nobles could use that against him in the future, even after Gravel took the throne. Don't worry what happens next. I'll take care of everything. His words seemed to help Aubrey make up his mind. He turned towards Ariel again. Was this it? Were they done? No, Edis. What? Please don't. So what do we do then? He didn't want Edis to die, but she had a point. He had no good answers on what to do. It wouldn't work if they all acted once. This wasn't a technique that you can overcome easily. Maybe Pedicus could do something. He hadn't moved an inch this entire time. Right now, he seemed to be staring at Rudius with a vaguely bored expression. <laughs> Rudius, could, Rudius could almost hear him saying, And what do you intend to do about this disgraceful state of affairs, Rudius Grey Rat? <laughs> He's just sitting there amused. <laughs> He's like, amuse me. I came all the way here. You better make this amusing. Considering two of his subordinates just died, he didn't look remotely concerned. I assume that he can just resummon them. I'm I'm curious about that. I would just assume that he could just rebuild them, re resummon them. Did he have some sort of plan in mind? Rudius couldn't put his faith in that possibility. There was no time for wishful thinking, and Aubrey was seconds from killing Ariel. He had to act. It was the only option. Electric spell was the best. It would hit others, but he couldn't afford to care right now. Even if it didn't take Rada or Aubrey out, there was a chance it would stun them. Master of the Water God style were capable of deflecting magic itself, so the odds of success weren't great, but it could work. I'd be curious about that. I mean, yes, the idea is that they can deflect magic, counter it, or whatever. But electricity, like, just branches so much. I guess it depends on how it's actually sent. If it has multiple branches and one of those branches can reach them, I'd, I'd be curious about that. Rius, are we doing this? Edda seemed to have read his thoughts by the expression on his face. Her fingers twitched slightly as she sent him a meaningful look. Apparently, they were going to die together. Sorry, Sylphie. Give us a nice funeral, right? Riding off into the sunset together. <laughs> As Rius began to brace himself to act, a jolt was felt to the core of his body. Aubrey had flinched violently and stopped in his tracks. 
A great bead of sweat rolled down Rita's face. Good Lord, is that... Everyone in the room began to tremble. Faces gone pale. Bodies visibly quivering, despite being frozen in place by Rita's sword. A wave of relief washed over Rudius. Apparently, he succeeded in passing mana to his ring. Well, this ain't good. Now I really wish you kept your trap shut about killing the princess, Darius. What, what is this? What is happening? Darius yelped. Why can't I stop shivering? Change of plans, Aubrey. Hate to do this to you, but can you grab Darius and make a run for it? Right now, please. <laughs> She's like, get the f*** out of here. Aubrey blinked in confusion. But why Darius rather than the Prince Grabble? I might be an old bag of bones, but I still have a debt or two that needs to repay in. Go on, get moving. At this rate, everyone in this room is going to end up dead. <laughs> she knows what's coming. Da 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 It's like the whole Jaws music playing. <laughs> Aubrey considered this for a moment, nodded, and then grabbed Darius and dragged his body from the table. This way, sir. V very well. They disappeared through the nearest door. No one was able to stop them as they were all pinned down by Rita. God grief. I wonder how far they'll manage to get. No guarantee he'll even come for me first. Now that I think about it. Ariel spoke up. Why him? Ariel's expression remained steady and composed the entire time, even in the face of death but she seemed puzzled by Rita's attempt to save Darius. Why, why, why? Everyone's so damn nosy today. Look, there's nothing interesting about it, all right? Rita smiled for a moment, looked genuinely amused before continuing. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> You're like, God, I just ask all these damn questions. Hmm, everybody let me tell you a story. <laughs> it's like an old lady, like, oh, suddenly somebody wants to spend time with me. Let me tell you a story, kid. Here's a little story for you. This was way back when a certain old lady was just a scrawny kid. Everyone was calling her a prodigy at the time. And Lord, was that ever going to her head? One day, this girl beat the tar out of some snotty noble in a training hall. Then he came back for revenge with two dozen friends. She was down and out in no time. And they were about ready to cut off both of her arms. So she could never hold the sore again, you see. And that was when a little noble boy, who outranked the other kids, showed up and saved her. When the girl made it all the way to Water King and got picked up by the royal sword instructor, she went looking for that boy to express her gratitude. But by that point, he'd already turned into a selfish blob of a man with all the charm of a jellyfish. Didn't even remember her. You better believe she was disappointed. I mean, this guy never had a pretty face, but she'd taken him for a pure, good-hearted type, at least. Sometimes, she'd done a bit of girlish daydreaming about her reunion. As Rita seemed to stare off into the distance, Ruiz was tempted to think that it was safe to move. Anyways... The girl's first love ended then and there, but I wouldn't say that it turned to hate exactly. Her gratitude and disgust canceled each other out. She told her story, briefly, in the little time that she had, knowing that her audience wouldn't care. It was almost like she was making a confession. It's like, yeah, it's, like, it's literally like I'm gonna die here soon, so I might as well tell somebody my story. <laughs> to tell the truth, she'd forgotten all about this herself, but on the road to Ashra many years later, she got this particular message in her dreams, told her she'd get a chance to repay that man if she went back to serve the royal court one last time. She was the man god's pawn after all. There it is. There's number two confirmed. Did I, did I even have that prediction? I don't remember if I had the prediction that it would be. I, I think at some point I talked about how it could be because she's older and she might actually fall right into that. But I don't know if I ever stuck on her as being one. For sure, Darius. Darius has always been like a an obvious. It has to, Darius has to be one. I kind of thought that Aubra wouldn't be one. It would be one that would be pushed to it. But there you go. She was the man god's pawn after all, and right now, the man that wanted to destroy her master was heading straight this way. Rudis could feel his overwhelming, terrifying aura growing stronger as he rushed through the palace at incredible speed. Aubra would be running the opposite direction. Rudis didn't have the ability to track his location, but he felt confident of that. The man had a sixth sense for danger after all. What a joke, right? All this for a man that she'd forgotten years ago. But when she looked back on it, now that she was old and gray, putting all that silly romance business to one side, she realized that the debt she owed was never actually paid. It was just sitting there for decades, accumulating interest. After a long pause, Rita's eyes snapped fully open. Looks like he's here. The doors to the hall burst open. A single man walked inside. Everyone in the room flinched in terror at the sight of him. Some losing control of their bladders. Probably Ariel. <laughs> Others collapsing to the ground. <laughs> he didn't say specifically Ariel. <laughs> Some glared at him like he was their mortal enemy, but all of them were thinking the same thing, more or less. He was going to kill us all. Orsted had finally arrived. It's time to make a donut shop. <laughs> it's time to make a donut shop. Boop, 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 boop. 
<laughs> That'd be great if that happened. Like, he just literally went through the room, just boop, 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 all the bad guys. It's been a while, Dragon God. Here to take an old lady to the afterlife. Yes. You are a disciple of the man god. That means you die. A disciple, eh? Hmm. So you let me off the hook before because I wasn't a disciple then. Good lord. Guess I'll go out fighting one hell of an opponent at least. Orsted began to walk in a straight line towards Rada, not even hesitating. Deprivation failed. Rada's sword became a blur, its shape shifting with impossible speed. Every time Orsted took a step, the blade struck him with a golden flash, briefly connecting them with an illusionary yellow string. Yet Orsted warded off every blow. Sparks danced in the air around him. He was deflecting her slashes with his bare hands. As he got closer, the air filled with bigger and greater sparks. Rada's strikes were glowing steadily, more powerful. Still, Orsted didn't stop. In no time at all, he was right in front of her. Die. Just like that, it was over. Orsted's spear hand strike punched a hole through Rada's chest. He tossed her body to the side like a rag doll. No, Master Rada, screamed Isolde. Despite the deadly zone of control disappearing, no one moved. It was as if time stopped entirely in that room. Nobody understood what just took place, but they feared that they might be next. Isolde was the first to break the spell, legs trembling. She drew her sword and pointed at Orsted. How, how dare you? How dare you? His face a mask of indifference. Orsted stepped out of the Terence and leapt into the air. As Isolde sprinted to follow him, Ariel shouted out to Rudius. Sir Rudius, you must follow Darius and Auber. We can't allow them to escape. Suddenly, everything was set in motion. Nobles of Osra tripped over each other to escape, and bodyguards hurried with them. Edis, Ghislaine, and Rudius exited to follow after Auber and Darius. Rudy, what just happened in here? Sylphie met them at the doorway, and Rudius decided against taking her. Isola was staring down from the terrace in a state of shock, seemingly giving up on catching Orsted. Sylphie, you stay with the Princess Ariel. Keep an eye on Isolda. She might try something. We're going after Darius. Got it. Dang it, Rudius. <laughs> you should have told her to watch Luke, too. I guess technically he told Sylphie a long time ago to watch Luke, but apparently she feels that. But yeah, I, I'm very curious about Isolda going in the future. I, I mean, the next chapter doesn't really technically get into it too much, but I am very curious as to what Isolda's thing is going to be going forward because literally Orsted killed Rada. Isolda is like master, somebody that she respected so much. And obviously she's very broken by this. And it's interesting like how Rudius tells Sylphie to watch Isolda Obviously implying the idea that this guy came in, killed Rada, which sort of signifies that that person is an ally of Ariel, which could mean in the future that Isolda is going to be their enemy. And I hate the idea that later on we're probably going to turn it to a thing where Isolda is going to learn that Orsted, that Rudius is working under Orsted and thus hate Rudius or want to take down Rudius in order to get to Orsted. I don't know. That, that seems like a stretch, but I guess it could go that direction. Again, it seems to be the words getting around that Rudius is a lapdog of Orsted. Um, so somebody could at least get that information. I'm not sure how open people are about the situation with Rudius working on Orsted. Obviously, his close relatives and and uh, his family and and Ariel know, but who else? Aubrey seemed to have gotten a hint of it. And again, that could be because he heard from somebody else, um, Darius. But um, yeah, I'd be curious to see what they do with her going forward because yes technically since she's joined the knights now she's going to be working under ariel and again they're implying right now that the dragon god has assisted ariel in ascending the throne she's probably not gonna like that <laughs> taking off to find darius rudius wasn't entirely sure why ariel had such urgency in her voice felt like the outcome of the contest was decided at this point a part of rudius wondered if it would make a difference if darius got away but maybe it was just because he heard the water god reminisce about their past together okay I can see Ariel still wanting to find Darius because Darius can still, again, he is the high minister. It's a very, very powerful position. I mean, that was the whole reason why there was such emphasis put on her, them taking Darius down. He has power in this place. I don't know exactly how they have their political structure set up, but it would, it, the assumption here would be literally the king, the high minister, and then everybody else is underneath that. This is somebody that holds a lot of power. And I guess and I would assume that if he got in the presence of the king himself, he could probably direct a lot of things in the way that he wants it to go. But yeah, I can kind of see Rudius here sort of going, should we still chase after him? Because in his own mind, he's wondering, maybe it's because I just heard this whole story from Rada, And now I'm sort of feeling a little guilty about this thing. Like, I don't know 
it, it seemed like it, he now feels a somewhat of a personal connection with their story and how they met each other. Darius did something really good for Rada, and I didn't really get into that earlier, but my God, I can, I, I, I see why Rada is doing this. Rada again, she's old. And she's getting older and older. She probably doesn't feel like she has many years left in her life. And this is this one thing she never repaid. In the eyes of a swordsman, a swordsmaster, there in their mind, their hands are everything. It's just like an artist. You hurt your hand, your career is over. There's very little options that you have to continue your art. Yes, there's ways you can still do it. I mean, you can still technically wear a prosthetic or something like that, something to hold the pen itself and still learn how to draw. It's just going to be a lot more difficult, not having that articulation in your fingers. The same thing for a swordsmaster. Your, your, your arms are your ability to fight. And even equally, the idea that you're right-handed and you lose your right hand, it's difficult to even switch to your left hand and still be good. There's These are your life. And she lived her entire life being an incredible swordsmaster. It was her life. She trained many people, accomplished many things, gained a status that is just unheard of for so many, for everybody else in the world, really. <laughs> like, there's only so, there's only one water god every generation. That's an insane title to have. All that reputation, all that wealth, all that status that she gained because he prevented her from losing her arms back then. That's huge. That, that means a lot for a swordsmaster. To think that this person back here essentially allowed me to have the life that I had. Otherwise, she would probably have died at that moment. There's a there's little chance that she would even survive having her arms chopped off. But even if she survived, what life would she have had? He literally allowed her to have a purposeful life. So I can see her doing this. But yeah, I can also see Rudius hearing that story and going... I, I kind of feel bad chasing this guy down. Maybe this this is, is what's sort of holding me back right now. Maybe I'm justifying that there's not a necessity to chase after him. I mean, he, it's done. Let him go. I mean, it's fine. There was another reason that Ariel may have given that order. She was a sworn follower of the dragon god now, just like Rudius. Maybe she felt like she couldn't allow a disciple of the man god to escape. Either way, they were going to kill Darius. That had always been the plan. That's another true thing. I, I can totally see her doing this right now, going, okay, literally... She was about to die. Orsted, her boss, came in the door, saved her life, and she allowed the thing that he's going after to get away. I need to do my part. He just saved my life. He just allowed me to win this fight that we were about to lose. I need to make sure that I do my part and take down somebody that is his enemy. And there's the idea that he could technically do something later. Again, like I said earlier. Ghislaine's nose led them as they sprinted down the hallways at an almost reckless speed. Edis and Ghislaine hadn't questioned Ariel's orders at all. The enemy had fled, so they had to hunt him down. It was probably just that simple. A few guards were spotted in the hallways, but they seemed to be chasing someone else. One yelled about someone fleeing towards the king's residence. So maybe it was Orsted. That was curious, because I was waiting for that to kind of come up again. It could come up later, um, because again, the, the a couple chapters later, it does technically get into Orsted. I'm kind of curious if they'll bring up that point. I wonder if Orsted goes there and kills the king. <laughs> All right, we need to get rid of this guy so that things kind of progress faster. I'm going to go kill him really quickly. That way we can just kind of speed things up. I can see that being the case. I can see that happening. I don't know. We'll see. I see them. They caught up with their prey in a matter of minutes. Darius was wheezing loudly as Auber carried his sizable bulk down the hallway. Spotting Rudius in the party, Auber clicked his tongue and pulled Darius into a nearby room. Inside the room, Rudius and the others stopped in their tracks. Darius was flat on the floor, Auber standing in front of him with his sword ready. Th this can't be happening. What? It's wrong. It's wrong. All wrong. Come now, Lord Darius. Sometimes life doesn't play exactly as you wish. Perhaps it's time that we accept things as they are and try to think our way out of this dilemma. I did everything the god commanded me. It's not right that I should be cowered like a rat. Goodness, you're certainly a pious one. In that case, perhaps try to catch your breath and say a few prayers for my victory. Auber scratched his cheek and lifted his sword with a resigned expression. For the first time, he was prepared to face them head on in battle. The poor guy. <laughs> I feel bad for the dude. North Emperor Auber Corbett. Sword King, Edis Greyrat. Sword King, Ghislaine de Dolia. As Rudius wondered if he should introduce himself as well, Darius jumped up and pointed at Eris. That, that red hair. You're a Boreas Greyrat girl. Edis grimaced in open disgust. Not anymore, I'm not. I've been an ally to the Boreas family, a true friend. I supported them financially, 
after the calamity of Fatoa. Reis remembered that he helped fund the Fatoan search and rescue squad. While he had some impure motives for doing so, it was hard to dismiss the point entirely. That money had helped a lot of desperate people. Yeah, that was kind of one of the interesting things in this whole segment right here is like, literally, he's like, wait, you're a Boreas girl. <laughs> it's like the red hair. It's like he's he literally wanted Edis, and it's almost as if he doesn't recognize her, which is kind of interesting. But again, that could have been more of a thing that they were trying to give him to Pylemon so that it would go to Darius. Not so much the idea, and it being more the idea that she was young. But I seem to remember that he specifically wanted Edis. Like he took a liking to her. At some point, he wanted her. Like he even tried to kidnap her. That's got nothing to do with me. I, I, I helped James as well. I helped him take control of the family. I protected and rebuilt House Boreas when the other nobles would have crushed it. That part was much harder for Rudius to give a damn about. Yeah, I mean, who cares about James rebuilding it and stuff? It's because of me that Fatoa is being reborn at this very moment. Actually, we gotta look at the Fatoa region on our way to the capital. It sure doesn't look like the reconstruction is moving very fast. You know nothing of these manners, boy. If the Boreas family had been crushed completely, the other lords would be cutting up the region for sale right now. The whole area would be a weak choke wasteland. That sounded plausible. It wasn't developing very quickly, but it may have been worse. You could have saved the old man's sorrows too, if you were trying to help. The words slipped from Maurice in a mutter, but Darius heard it and contorted it in anger. Here's where Darius messed up. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he was doing very good right here with his little, his attempts to kind of gain favor, but this didn't help. <laughs> it's like, this didn't help. And again, that kind of goes back to the whole thing where I'm not sure that he's realizing who Edis is, like he's forgotten about her or something. Which, to that point, Again, he forgot Rada, and I think he's forgotten Edis. Like, this is a guy that forgets people, I guess. Saros, don't be ridiculous. The man had all the prudence of a wild boar. He wanted to use the entire fortune of the House Boreas on rebuilding Fatoa without a thought of the consequences. It was a bold and brave decision, but it did sound foolish under the circumstances. If the Boreas family went under, the whole region would end up falling prey to the nobles anyways. I think the idea here really is that he's going to use all of his money. This is... My gosh, I, I hate that we're going back to how great Soros was again. <laughs> I mean, I still think it was dumb that he literally just ignored that thing in the sky. Like, he could have brought people in there to stop it, but he didn't. But even still, afterwards, he tried to make things right. And maybe it was because he knew he let that be. It was, I think he may have found himself at fault. And so he was trying to do good. But I think he would have done anyways. He, it did seem like he did like that land. He did like taking care of people. He wasn't a bad ruler in any, in any stretch or a lord, liege lord. So I can see him afterwards going, okay, I'm going to take all of my money and I'm going to help this whole place rebuild and the people get their homes back and rebuild the streets, rebuild the homes, rebuild everything, rebuild the crops, get this place up and going again, save the people's land at the cost of all of his wealth. He would lose his power of wealth. And what he's saying here would lead to his destruction. But it wouldn't matter. It seemed like it, in that case, it wouldn't matter to him. He would sacrifice his house to save the people, which is super cool. It's <laughs> super cool. And I think there's a side of that. It was probably for uh, Edis as well. But he didn't get that a chance. They executed him. James begged me to put the stop to that foolishness. And I did exactly that. I goaded Palmon into action. I cornered that blundering old fool and had him executed. I put James in control. I'm the only reason the Boreas family and the Fatoa region still exist. So please, have mercy. Let me go free. That's all I ask. So that makes you the murderer of my grandfather then? I see. That clears things up. Ghislaine bared her teeth and grasped her sword tightly. I'm going to kill you now. Yee! <laughs> As Darius shrieked and stumbled backwards, Aber sighed warily. <laughs> it seems our negotiations have broken down. <laughs> yeah, that last part was a screw up, dude. <laughs> you done screwed up right there. Yeah, that technically does play into what I was thinking about. Like, again, I I, rem I seem to distinctly remember both the anime and the light novel covering that whole segment where he got executed, and it was like, but it was always it was always Grabble and Darius up there sneering and and snickering, like it, it made it made me feel like he was the one involved. Um, so I guess this is finally revealing that yes, they they pushed Palmon to it, which again makes sense. It was that they wanted Palmon to take the the heat for it, wanted to manipulate Palmon to do it, not them have to get involved. As Darius seemed to come to terms with reality, he dropped into a chair and stared at the ground as he took deep breaths. It was hard to believe that he was screaming in a frenzy moments earlier. Can you win this fight, Aubur? Difficult to say. Two sword kinds would be challenge enough, but that magician is quite troublesome. Aubur stood between them and Darius, two swords in his hand. His expression was perfectly calm, but his eyes darted constantly. It was almost as if they were moving independently from each other. I know God told me the same thing. What did he say specifically? 
that magician wearing the grey robe would murder me, but perhaps his words were lies from the start. It was God who told me to destroy the teleportation circles in the face of all oppositions, and to call you back to the palace, where we could harden our defenses. The result was this catastrophe. There you go. So yeah, it kind of implies the idea that, yes, he was told to destroy the teleportation circles. Then he was summoned again and told to call him back to the palace and to harden his defenses. And probably at that point that Ruiz was going to kill him. So this implies that he at least seen the man god twice. So the man god was moving things behind the scenes. It seemed that Orsa was right that the man wasn't much of a chess player. Handle that, Opper. This is what I hired you to do. Fighting multiple opponents is your specialty, is it not? Understood. But in the event of my victory, I will require a special reward. Of course, it's yours. As promised, North God style, Crimson Ink. As Edis and Ghislaine leapt to attack, Rudius knew exactly what Crimson Ink meant. Orsid told him about it. Albert managed to lay a trap on the floor, and it was too late to warn them. After a loud bang, thick, sticky liquid spattered in all directions, gluing their feet to the ground. The small balls on the floor were the creation of a master apothecary, containing an instant adhesive that was monstrously strong. Roos responded with a flash flood spell, washing the sticky mess away. Aubrey's glue was vulnerable to water. Still, Edis and Ghislaine were already thrown off balance. They still tried to fall through with their attacks, but it was too late. Aubrey passed between them. This meant that they couldn't use their sword of light without striking each other. You're first, Rudius Grey Rat, as he brought down both blades on Rudius. Rudius blocked it with his left hand, forming a shield, Earth Shield. He knew when and where his attacks were coming, thanks to all of his sparring with Edis, and he could see clearly with his eye of foresight. North God style, nebulous cross. Aubrey's hands went to a blur, releasing both of his swords midair. He ducked down and grabbed another blade at his waist. Rudy's seen this in advance, forming an earth shield down his right forearm to block the next attack, but he couldn't move fast enough. Reese's left hand had already met Aubrey's first sword head on. Aubrey was going to draw and strike in one smooth motion as he pitched forward. There was no way to defend against it. Reese would have to take the hit, springing into the air from half bent knees. Reese took Aubrey's strike to his left leg. Something hot swept through his shin and his leg crumpled underneath him as he landed. Rudy's every fight is going to lose a limb. <laughs> didn't didn't Or Ar did make some comment like that? Here, take these scrolls. You have a habit of losing losing limbs, so it's perfect for you. <laughs> every fight you lose a limb, you're gonna need these. It's dangerous to go along without <laughs> losing your limbs. Take these. Aubrey had cut through his shin. It took a second for the pain to shoot through him. Reese ground his teeth and endured the agony as best he could. From the corner of his eyes, Edis was already in motion, and Ghislaine had spun around as well. He had survived, and now Aubrey was surrounded. But then something caught Reese's eye. Some movement in the back of the room. It was Darius, pointing his right hand their way. Let the vast and blessed flame converge at thy command. Edis, noticing this, spun around and headed straight towards Darius. Ghislaine placed herself in front of Rudius. Fireball! A flame projectile shot from Darius's hand, its speed and size sufficient to kill. Edis cut the fireball in half mid-air, but as she did, Aubrey threw a small kunai-like dagger that struck her flank. Aubrey had blocked Ghislaine's strike, but not entirely. It slashed into his shoulder, but the cut was too shallow to remove his arm. Aubrey leapt backwards with a somersault to be met by Edis waiting for him, but due to the injury at her side, he was able to ward off her strike. Rhys knew it would be bad if he took Darius and fled. Ghislaine would be the only one that would be able to chase them. They had to take down Darius. Rhys fired a stone cannon at Darius, only for Aubrey to slice it midair. Expecting this to happen, Rhys had sent a variation of stone cannon at them that exploded next to Darius. It was called Burst Stone Cannon. <laughs> Finally, Rhys is changing it up. That's what I was talking about. Change it up. You're relying too much on the same thing over and over again. Stone cannon, stone cannon, cone. change it up. Um, again, this is one of those moments where he reveals, I made a new spell. <laughs> it's like, oh, did, pff, I guess we're just not going to mention when he's sitting there practicing new spells. Which is, oh, I'm just going to create a new thing out of nowhere. Oh, I've been working on this for a long time. <laughs> just like, boop, here it is. Refugion likes to do that. Here's a, here's a new spell that Rudius learned that he didn't want to tell anybody the entire time. Fragments of the projectile caught Darius right in the eyes. He curled into a crouch and grabbed desperately at his eyes. Aubrey's eyes flashed back towards him for a moment, and Edis responded with a sword of light. Aubrey blocked it, turning his sword sideways and meeting the blow with the thickest part of his blade. Edis' sword cut quickly through Aubrey's and finally sunk into his arm. But the cut was shallow, her injury probably preventing a fully executed technique. Ghislaine then attacked, and while Aubrey tried to evade it, her sword of light wasn't the kind of attack that you could dodge. It was unstoppable, inescapable trump card of the sword god style. The only way to counter it was to disrupt the user's movements, throw them off balance, or position yourself where they couldn't use it. Aubrey had done exactly that throughout the battle, but in the very end, he simply couldn't. Ghislaine's flawless sword of light hit his shoulder and ripped down his flank. Splendidly done, murmuring those final words. 
Auber collapsed to the floor, flat on his back. A pool of blood spread out from around him. For a few moments, he twitched and quivered, but light faded from his eyes, and he stopped moving. Auber was dead. Finally, <laughs> that dude was a little cockroach. Three battles, and that dude snuck out and snuck out and snuck out. I like right here that Rudy specifically puts that this is something that he had done flawlessly every time. You had to put him off their balance. You had to position yourself where they couldn't attack. You had to disrupt their movements. He did that every single time. Edis right here is constantly not able to get it off properly because she's been wounded. She's been put off balance, basically. Her movements have been disrupted. Uh, with the whole glue, movements disrupted. How they stopped him when they turned on him. They were still going to follow through with it. He put himself in a position they couldn't do it. Otherwise, they'd hit each other. He's been doing this the whole time. This one time, he couldn't pull off. He pulled it off for Edis again because she's injured. Couldn't pull it off for Ghislaine, who wasn't disrupted, was in a good position, wasn't put off balance, nailed it. It goes to show that Auber was very familiar with the sword guy style, very familiar with a sword of light. He knew what to do in order to counter it. But it is interesting that they kind of note several times Edis constantly unable to follow through or properly do the technique. And there's, I guess, so much emphasis on the idea that she got hit by that strike in her side. And I'm wondering if a lot of it has to do with what they find out here in a minute about the poison. I'm wondering if that specifically was kind of holding her back, or is it simply having that injury there? Which, if that's the case, that seemed like that was a bit too much to kind of disable her. A simple wound being that significant to her ability to even fight. My eyes! Auber! Help me, Auber! Darius was curled up, clenching his face and screeching. Ghislaine walked over, looked down at him, glanced to Rudius and Edis, both of them nodding. She then swung her sword down. Blood sprang so far it hit Rudius' cheek. They left Darius's corpse where it was. Ariel had requested that they leave the body where it fell. It was very likely that she'd be accused for murder later on, but apparently she believed it would actually improve her public image. Yeah, I mean, if they set up the idea that he did something so terrible and then following it up with this, and plus, yes, technically the whole thing with Rada and Auber, all that's going to be pinned on him at this point. Everybody's seen what Rada said, that she was there for Darius, and then what Darius said before he was taken away. He was a part of that. What Rada did there, he was a part of. High Minister Darius sure hadn't made himself too many friends and admirers. They had murdered him, and wow, he had it coming. It still left a sour taste in Rudy's mouth. He hadn't finished him off himself, but that was hardly relevant. He killed Darius as much as Ghislaine had. He'd killed Auber for protecting him, then Darius as he squatted on the ground, blind and helpless. For the first time, it felt real. He knew deep down he was a murderer. He wasn't sure why it was different this time. Maybe because this was one up close and personal. It was hard to say. With a small sigh, Rudy shook his head. It wasn't worth dwelling on, was it? This was the path he had chosen and had come to terms with. It is definitely interesting that this is the one that he finally has this feeling with. I was kind of curious if he would bring up the idea of, of Darius literally pleading for his life. That, that would be a, a significantly different one. Because Rudius has seen death over and over again. He has been around people who have killed. He was around, again, he was earlier, he was with, you know, Ghislaine and Edis as child assassins were coming after them. And they were killing them. Why Darius? Of all of these, I would have more sympathy and more upset over assassins, especially young ones. If I'm with, you know, Edis and Ghislaine, and we have Ariel with us, and suddenly this child assassin comes running up and, you know, I quagmire him and Ghislaine slices him in half. I'd feel more worse about that because that would probably be a kid that is being manipulated. They're technically innocent in a lot of cases. I, yeah, technically older assassins, they're usually doing it because they're getting paid or they're being forced by somehow. But they have, they have a lot of their own choice there and they're doing it by their choice. Whereas a child, I can see them being manipulated and I think that that was the only thing they had to do. And they had to do it. And that they don't see why they're doing is wrong. And I would see that being more difficult. And that being more the idea of killing somebody. Not Darius, who has done horrible things in the past and now suddenly is whining because it's not working out for him. Again, it's very, it's very interesting that this is the first time that he's like, now it's affecting me. It's odd. And again, I, I think that might be partly because there is an aspect of societally, it will be seen as murder. Like there is a, 
when you're again taking the whole assassin thing into account, when you have assassins coming to you that probably have no names, they're probably all bought. They're probably all from forced servitude and cages, and they're being bought and then trained to fight. That's pretty much what Darius was doing with a lot of these kids. But I can see a lot of cases where like those people are coming after you and you kill them out of self defense. Nobody's going to question it. By law, nobody's going to question it. Oh, it's a, it was an assassin that was sent. Nobody questions it. They scoop the body away, probably burn it, you know, what, whatnot. But Darius is a well-known figure in this entire kingdom. He doesn't die, and if he dies, everybody knows about it. Every single person in that kingdom is going to know about it. That isn't something you cover up. That's, nothing, that's something you don't just shrug off and walk away. There's going to be repercussions for this. Like he said earlier, Ariel's probably going to be deemed as the person that seen to his murder. She's going to be seen as fault. And maybe Rudius, in societal terms, feels that guilt like, crap, I did a murder. This is going to come back at me. But again, he's saying it's different this time. It felt real. He felt deep down that he was a murderer. Again, it's very weird. It's very weird that he chose he chose this moment. But even still, he's like, eh, no point in dwelling on it. This is what I chose. And again, I think that's where it kind of signifies the idea that this might be a label. Now society is going to see that I killed somebody, murdered somebody. This will affect me in society's eyes, I guess is the best way to put it. Moving to the next room, Reese used one of the King Tier healing scrolls to treat his injury. His nearly severed leg was back to normal in an instant. He was still feeling kind of cold, though, probably due to the blood loss. Edis was up next, face gone pale, watching him treat himself. But once it was over, she pulled her shirt up quickly enough, revealing her alluring, well-defined... <laughs> he noticed the wound was bright purple. Aubur's kunai was poisoned. It was like a very brief, like, um... I guess, I, I think in general, it's a, it's a wake-up call for Rudeus. But at the same time, there is, like, an element here, like, dude, it's time to learn better detoxification. <laughs> like, if after this whole thing ends and he has a he has a moment to breathe, because I don't know if we're going to go straight into something else. Um, if he has a moment after this segment, he better be hitting the books. I want this dude, like, I spent the next three years of my, uh, three months of my life focusing on learning detoxification. There's too many moments where detoxification is... A big issue for Rudius' life. Again, future Rudius lost Roxy. And I thought back then he would learn it. I honestly thought back then he was going to learn the best that he can of detoxification. He needs to learn these spells. <laughs> he needs to learn these spells. Stop. It's good enough. I'm smart enough. I have enough capability. Learn it all, dude. Using elementary and intermediate detoxification, it had no effect. Cold sweat ran down Rudius' back as he stared at the wound. But then he remembered that Orsid said that Auber favored a certain type of poison. It wasn't lethal, and he always carried an antidote for it. Again, I think this is probably was what was draining her strength. I think that poison was literally making her weaker so that she couldn't bring down that sort of light. He literally threw that at her to poison her to steal away her strength. And this kind of makes me believe that right here, because it's specifically not lethal. Well, why would you poison somebody? Again, to cause some sort of status effect on them. Hurrying back to the other room, he found the antidote on the body before using it on Edis and some on himself. After a few anxious moments, the color of Edis's skin slowly returned to normal. He breathed a shaky sigh of relief. If it was lethal poison, she might have died. Thank God, that was way too close. Again, it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. <laughs> nice job dodging Nebula's cross. It wasn't exactly a dodge, more avoiding a fatal blow. Maybe that counted. I only pulled that off because of all my sparring lessons with you, Edis. I've seen even faster slashes, so I managed to react in time. You know, I never even dodged that one myself. There was a hint of sadness in her voice. Auber had been one of her instructors. The memories of those days probably flashed through her mind. Still, a moment later. Well, whatever. Rudeus was envious how quickly she put her past behind her. Bottom line, though, Rudeus, Ghislaine, and Edis all survived. They won the battle they were here to fight. Key thing there, Ghislaine lived. <laughs> Now, I don't know, something can happen even after the battle and everything settles, but yeah, I was I was actually very surprised that Ghislaine made it through. I was, this whole fight with Aubrey, I'm like, here comes. Ghislaine's so god. I'm still thinking Ghislaine was flagged. Ugh. But no, I, I do feel like, I don't know, Edis is like very, very hard to read. Like, we're going back to, I mean, this is kind of the same thing I was dealing with with um, Sylphie. Um, when I was when I was talking about Sylphie a while back, and I started getting my theories on her idea of 
literally not expressing herself and keeping it all bottled up and bottled up and sort of personifying her existence as Fitz, even after she has shed the persona of Fitz. Like, she is now Sylphie. She's not walking around as Fitz anymore, which Fitz was all about, you know, not showing her emotions. And I felt like that was kind of a thing with her that I sometimes was curious about what she really thought about situations. And right here, I almost feel that same feeling with Edis. Like, I think there is a side of it that she is not being completely honest about how she feels. And I think that was kind of an interesting sign, especially with, like, walking past Fatoa and her thoughts about her li her past life and what she really wants. And then when it came to talking about getting revenge for Saros, acting as if she didn't care. But then she actually did care. She was technically, you know, squeezing her sword like she's mad. Like, oh, when we finally found the person that killed my grandfather. She does care. I mean, this is another case right here where she's giving on the facade that she doesn't care. But in actuality, she did. Now, there's two sides of it. There could be an idea that, yes, she did have respect for Auber. She did thank Auber for teaching her everything that she knew. Because technically, because of Auber, she's able to do what she wants to do, which is to protect Rudius. He gave her, in small part, you know, it was a, it was a group effort. He was one of the many people that taught her how to be as strong as she is now. So she can do what she's always wanted to do, stand at Rudy's side. So I think there could be a lot of this is respect for Auber and those memories of fighting, you know, training with him. I don't so much think it's an aspect of her liking him as a friend or something like that, but it could be a respect and a, and a gratitude. It was just more curious that she never brought it up, but I think that's because she was focused on, he's my enemy right now and he's threatening Rudy's life. Put, a, put behind me everything else. I don't care that he trained me. I don't care that he's partly the reason why I'm able to stand at Rudy's side. He is threatening Rudy's now. Now what remained was our triumphant return. However, returning to the hall where the party had been held, they had a surprise waiting for them, but not the fun kind. Luke had a sword at Ariel's neck, while Sylphie furiously glared at him with her rod in her hand, and Palmon knelt on the floor. As they stood stunned at the doorway, Luke's gaze flashed to Rudy's. He spoke up, words directed to Sylphie. If you want to save Princess Ariel, kill Rudy here and now. And reply, Silphy killed Rudius. <laughs> Can't stupid joke. Like, oh, whatever, Andrew, whatever. And that is chapter 10. Uh, such a good, good, good set of chapters, especially, especially Orchid showing up. That was so freaking epic. It kind of reminded me a lot of that whole segment with um, Pettigoose showing up at the Demon Continent. Is, is that like. I hope they nail that. Like, with the whole situation at the Demon Continent and him showing up and just going, and it just slices Atoff in half and she just goes flying off in the distance. I'm like, please nail that. Throw some Sawana Hiroyuki music in there, please. Um, the same thing here. Like, just literally doors open. You're a pawn of the man god. Douche, douche, douche. And there's, there's all this flash and sparks happening. The sparks are getting bigger and bigger. And then suddenly, whoosh, and then just jumped out the door. <laughs> He just literally walks in, stab, throw, leaves. Like, I'm done. Peace out. Like, he should have... <laughs> he should have had him, like, just stab her, toss her to the side, go over, drink some punch, put the cup down, and then walk out the door. That would have been better. Just, like, get a quick quick drink. You know? Might as well. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe Orsted never has to drink. He, he might not actually grow hungry or need a drink. Uh, that's actually a very curious question. I think one of the most interesting things about the fight between uh, Orsted and Rada is like, it is that whole idea of how do you counter, 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 counter? Like, is it is it literally the two of them facing off to each other turns into the element of who can counter the best? Because literally, that's Orsted. Like, it's is literally waiting for somebody to strike and deflecting. And literally, that's, that's what she's doing is that as he's fighting her, she's striking because he's moving and he's a threat. So she's striking. So she's going on the offense, but he's able to deflect it and constantly. And so it's like her whole style is attacking those inside of her circle to defend herself and, and a counter to anything that comes into it. But it's a perfect counter, but it's going against his ability to be basically perfect counter and perfect deflection. And so it kind of turns this whole thing of literally who's the best? It's like they both have the capability of deflecting and striking and countering, but who's the best? It kind of goes back to what they were talking about with like the 
the sword guy style and the water guy style and everything, and where there's this emphasis on the idea of the only time that you can actually overcome it is to be stronger. This idea that they're so powerful as the water god style to deflect things and counter things, the only way that you can really overcome it is to just be that dang faster and that much stronger. You have to be like a certain level to overcome it. So it's just a, just a really cool like kind of head to face to face between the two of them. And again, yes, technically emphasizing that she has once faced off against him. And I wonder if she faced off against him at, I don't know if they imply that. We know that the sword god himself did face off against Orsted at some point. I don't know that he implied that he faced off against him with Rada, but it seems to obviously imply that, yes, Rada as well had once faced off against him. And I like how she points out that, and you love me live, and now you're not, because now I am apparently a disciple of this man god. Well, that's weird. You're going to let me live this. You're not going to let me live this time. <laughs> uh, it is kind of interesting the idea that she at some point faced off against him. And I think the, I think the sword god mentioned that as well, this idea that Despite that, he let him live. But she goes back to what we know about Orsted. Orsted isn't going out and killing these people. He doesn't want to kill everybody. He just is literally just killing anybody that's a disciple. If they're not a disciple, if this is some, like, I guess, victory seeker, some person that just wants to fight him and get some kind of glory, he's, like, not going to kill them. It's like, whatever. Because, again, technically, that could cause a butterfly effect. He doesn't want to kill anybody that he doesn't need to kill because they might need they might need to be living <laughs> for something in the future. So, very interesting. But, yeah, I still get it. <laughs> I still, but yeah, I still get a kick out of the fact that or, this entire time, Pedagus is just sitting there going, this is, do something, do something entertaining for me. Anyways, yeah, that's, that's chapter 10. Of course, I'm going to be cutting it off here. So we're running a little bit long and I don't know, it's the next chapter's length. Yeah, that's another like seven pages on my document. So yeah, that would be way too long. But anyhow, yeah, that was a exciting set of chapters. Really enjoyed it. Looking forward. My gosh, I am extremely excited to talk about next Mishuka Monday. Chapter 12, I've only peeked into it. Uh, looks absolutely crazy. Um, chapter 11 is going to be... I'm very mixed on. I'm very mixed on chapter 11, mainly because I like what's in it. There's some really great character moments in it. Such good character moments. Some actual nice reveals about like an entire house. But at the same time, it felt cheesy it still felt a little cheesy i'm i'm happy with how things ended <laughs> it's just there's a side of me that's like that's not refugian's best writing I, I just feel like it's not refugian's best writing but i still really enjoy it so i'm looking forward to talking about it but yeah that's until next mashuko monday i thank you guys so much for dropping by for this premiere again thanks chat for dropping by hope you guys are doing well and i hope you guys have a great rest of your monday uh thank you so much for being here again thank you guys so much for your support your kind words uh, sharing this out, telling your friends, just all of it, all the things you guys do to support the channel, and especially those that support the channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships, all that good stuff. It means a great deal to me. But yeah, with all that said, thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. And until the next Mashuka Mondays, y'all take care. Happy Mashuka Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trip. Happy Mushoko Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek the Mushoko Tensei JavaScript Reincarnation. Now we'll see you again. Happy Mushoko Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek the Mushoko Tensei JavaScript Reincarnation novel series. We're on volume 17, chapter 8. Is it 8? It's 9. Ghislaine bared her feet. The whole area would have been weak. The whole area would have been a weak choke wasteland. The whole area would be a weak choke. The whole area would be weak choke. Would be a weak choke. Would be a weak choke. Would be a weak choked. Nice job dodging. Nice job. Nice job dodging Nodger. Why can't I say this? Nice job dodging Nebulous Cross.